And then before we get started with our uh, regularly uh, scheduled um, agenda today, I wanted to introduce Sarah Hanna. And some of you um, actually might have already received a bag from us this morning. If you haven't, um, you will find it, we'll find you or you'll find it um, in the loggia by the check-in tables. But inside the bag, if you've taken a peek, there's a beautiful piece of art created by um, our artist who is here with us uh, of this factor, and we're so, so happy about that. Um, it's Sarah Hanna. Um, let me, just gonna read a little bit about Sarah. She's a visual artist and professional arts educator um, who has taught creative students from her studios in California, Florida, and the French Riviera. In 2020, Sarah created her Art in Residence program, an in-home family painting experience that blends joy and experience on enormous canvases. Um, and if you have participated in her class, you have probably experienced that, um, that joy um, with her. And so she created uh, the, the, these, and um, the icons were hand illustrated after asking the MIB Junior Advisory Board members, what does MIB represent to you? So I just wanted to have her come up here. Good Thank morning, you so much. everyone. Thank you so much for having me. This has been such a rewarding, wonderful experience. I'm learning. I'm getting to share in your joy. And I um, just wanted to give a quick explanation. Yes, we talked to the Junior Advisory Board. They said, I said, what does MIB mean to you? We're going to turn that into an illustration. And so it was medicine, hope, love, fun in the form of gaming until they met me and then art should be on here at some point. Um, research, belonging, and honoring our osteo angels, honoring our osteo warriors. It was a joy to create, a joy to be here, and I love the idea of art and science complementing each other, being a source of therapy and escape, and that is so important to me. It's really, it's really great to be here. So I'd love to introduce, all the way from Hawaii, one of our incredible Incredible Osseo Warriors, please welcome to the stage this morning, Ali Tamayose. Okay, hi, good morning. My name is Ali Tamayose. I'm 16 years old and I'm from Paul City, Hawaii. I'm a member of the Junior Advisory Board and I was diagnosed with metastatic osteosarcoma in January 2018. My primary tumor was in my left femur and was removed in April 2018 with a limb salvage surgery. I am currently still in treatment and I'm still fighting. I have lung mets that we tried to treat with surgeries, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, a CAR-T2 clinical trial, and we are now trying SBRT with immunotherapy infusions. Earlier this year, I developed brain mets that were treated with a craniotomy and brain radiation. It is because of all I've gone through that I'm here to cause a cure. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Alex Huang, who will be moderating the immunotherapies panel. Dr. Huang is a pediatric oncology physician scientist at UH Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital and Case Western University. Dr. Huang has an active basic and translational research program focused on cellular and molecular immunology, and immuno-oncology. His lab's research has focused on defining vulnerabilities within the osteosarcoma tumor microenvironment that can be translated into clinical trials in the next few years. Most recently, his team has opened the Nadalizumab trial targeting unresectable pulmonary osteosarcoma and they are working on opening several other clinical trials targeting refractory, metastatic, and recurrent osteosarcoma. So, Dr. Huang. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, she is already a winner, um, beating me in the, in the game earlier yesterday. <laughs> so, um, but uh, this is fantastic. Uh, uh, welcome to, to this morning's session. My name is Alex Huang. It's been an honor to be part of this, and I just want uh, the families and the patients to know that uh, MIB has changed me. And uh, I think uh, reflecting back the last few years, this has been a life-changing experience, a career-changing experience, and hopefully uh, we can bring more uh, to the table and, and offer hope as we go along. I think arguably this morning's session uh, to me is obviously a biased view, but this is the most uh, exciting session of the whole conference. 
not only because it's immunotherapy, but also because we feature a unique all young investigator panel. This is the future, right here. You're looking at them. Give them a hand. Um, and so thank you for the part that MIB is, is making and taking in part of their develop, uh, career development. And so this morning we'll feature six speakers um, and they are um, focused primarily on targeting the vulnerabilities that exist within the tumor microenvironment. And, um, and I will just, uh, you have already seen this illustration where uh, in the tumor microenvironment is not just the tumor cells that are causing problems, but as Ryan Roberts uh, uh, described very evidently yesterday, that there are other enablers in, in that cooperation that enables the metastatic disease or primary disease to take hold. And so many of these potential targets are ripe for, uh, for uh, exploitation. And so we are gonna feature six different talks among uh, all the young investigators, and they will be talking about uh, various different components of within this tumor microenvironment, molecular targets, cellular targets, engineer targets, how to, how to think about them effectively into therapeutics. So Betsy Young, who is finishing her clinical fellowship, uh, I guess this week, next week, and then she will be going into her fourth year fellowship at UCSF. She'll be targeting, uh, targeting STING and uh, EMPP1 to reprogram immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. And then she will be uh, followed by Ariana uh, Anjay, uh, who is a senior research assistant getting her PhD, I heard, uh, in aerosolizing gemcitabine to modulate tumor microenvironment and to increase NK cell efficacy. She's from MD Anderson. And then Emily will be talking about uh, targeting CD70, which is a, a pretty up and coming uh, interesting target in immunotherapeutics. Uh, using CAR NK cells to enhance NK cell cellulitic effect in oxysarcoma. She's a PT Monk fellow from MD Anderson. And then Dr. Uh, uh, John Ligon, who is an assistant professor at University of Florida, uh, will be talking to us for uh, using uh, RNA nanoparticle vaccines to overcome the tumor microenvironment TME or metastatic osteo. He will then be followed by Krista von Haste, uh, who is an assistant professor at, at Rainbow Babies to talk about how to use TGF-beta targeting small molecule inhibitors in osteosarcoma. And they will be wrapped up with uh, Pradeep uh, Shrestha, who is, I'm interested to find out what Odyssey Fellow means, um, but from MD Anderson. Uh, and then he'll be talking about using STAT3 inhibitor, WP1066, as a novel therapeutic uh, agent in lung metastatic osteo. So uh, looking forward to a fruitful presentation and conversation. Um, before the meeting, they, various people on this panel told me they're a little bit nervous. Uh, for many of them, this is their first big show. And so appreciate the audience for giving them this opportunity and uh, an opportunity to, to hear all the hard work that they have been doing and, uh, and the support they're gonna receive from this audience. So I'm gonna give the time over to our first speaker who unfortunately cannot join us, um, but uh, she'll be presenting in per remotely via Zoom, Betsy. I'm going to see how we how we're going to switch over. Oh, there she is. Take it Hi, away. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Pong. Um, so thank you so much to MIB agents for the opportunity to share my work on this panel. And thank you in particular to Christina Iptoma and the AV team in San Diego for making it possible for me to present virtually this morning. I'm so sorry not to be there in person. So I wanted to start off by um, giving some background on what we know about the immune system in osteosarcoma, which really is the foundation for our development of the immunotherapy approaches you'll hear about um, from all of us. It has been well established that the standard immunotherapy approaches um, have not yielded um, great benefit in osteosarcoma. Correlatively, median immune infiltrate is lower in osteosarcoma than other tumor types where immune checkpoint inhibition has been uh, more effective, and neoantigen expression in osteosarcoma is generally low. Beyond these observations, really the mechanisms of immune evasion are not well established in osteosarcoma yet. Uh, as you can see on the left, what we have seen is that relative to other pediatric solid tumor types, osteosarcoma has pronounced expression of immunosuppressive molecules, including uh, CSF1R and TGF-beta-1. 
um, with the highest median expression among all tumor types in one study cohort of pediatric solid tumors here. We also have gotten a hint about the role, um, the immunosuppressive role of macrophages from um, this study on the right side here. Um, this study suggested that a greater abundance of macrophages in tumors um, was associated with a more adverse prognosis. So you're gonna hear about a lot of exciting new approaches um, in the subsequent talks, including um, cell-based therapies and other targeted therapies for the tumor microenvironment. Um, but for just another moment, let's focus in on the tumor itself. And um, my work really um, centers on these tumor intrinsic properties that shape the osteosarcoma tumor microenvironment. And we do know that different uh, cancers um, shape the tumor microenvironment in different ways. Some examples of this are depicted right here on the left. Um, and so my studies really address this central question. What are the specific mechanisms by which osteosarcoma shapes and maintains an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment? As we sought out to answer this question, um, we observed that one of the key conserved features of osteosarcoma, which you heard a lot about yesterday, was chromosomal instability. So we asked the question as to whether the maintenance of chromosomal instability may implicate a specific type of immune evasion. And this led us to the sting pathway. As you can see in the top half of this panel, which is sort of the quote unquote normal functions of this sting pathway, um, it's a pathway that mediates innate immune responses to cytosolic or cytoplasmic DNA in a cell. It starts off with a pathogen related uh, warning signal, which is DNA in the cytoplasm, and it results in an, an innate immune response. So here are some of the important intermediate steps. Cytoplasmic DNA is sensed by C-gas, which produces the second messenger C-GAMP, which activates the pathway namesake sting protein and leads to interferon gene expression. C-GAMP can also be exported to stimulate sting and immune activation in surrounding cells, such as macrophages. So cancer cells, in particular those with high levels of chromosomal instability, also have this same warning signal in their cytoplasm. In fact, we've observed micronuclei and cytoplasmic double-stranded DNA in all of the osteosarcoma cell lines that we've tested. So this has really called into question the possibility that osteosarcoma has adapted ways to dysregulate the sting pathway, um, tolerating chromosomal instability and evading immune surveillance. This dysregulation seems to occur in at least two different ways as um, depicted in this bottom half here. And this may vary across different osteosarcomas. So one mechanism is dysregulation of sting itself um, as shown by the X over the sting protein. Um, and another one that we've really been most focused on um, is this activity of this extracellular protein called ENPP1 that degrades the immunotransmitter CGAMP and actually produces an immunosuppressive molecule adenosine. We have found high levels of ENPP1 in osteosarcoma samples and thus we've hypothesized that ENPP1 activity may be one mechanism by which osteosarcoma tolerates chromosomal instability and mediates immune evasion. Briefly, I wanted to mention um, that, uh, just provide a quick uh, foray into the models that I've used in my subsequent slides. So you heard from Dr. Sweet Cordero yesterday that we focused in the lab on the development and fine tuning of this orthotopic model of spontaneous uh, metastasis. So following implantation of an osteosarcoma cell line into the hind limb of the small animal, um, we're able to perform amputation to remove the primary tumor and then um, study spontaneous metastasis effects. So based on this working model that I have here on the left side of the slide, um, we really sought out to address the role of ENPP1 in osteosarcoma animal models. We first engineered the osteosarcoma cell line U2OS to overexpress ENPP1 and studied the effects of this modification on lung metastasis. In both IV models, of experimental metastasis and orthotopic models of spontaneous metastasis on the left and the right here, ENPP1 appears to have a strong effect in increasing the metastatic potential of this cell line. The purple um, portions of these plots are the tumors with high levels of ENPP1 compared to the controls, which are almost not visible here with very low levels of uh, lung metastasis in both of these experiments. 
Now, given this strong phenotype in a relatively small orthotopic experiment, I recently repeated this in a larger cohort. And while the effects on metastasis remain pending, I wanted to show the orthotopic tumor growth curves to demonstrate the strong effects of ENTP1 over expression. Again, here in purple, um, this is a, a, a plot uh, showing the actual uh, tumor growth curves of each individual animal in the experiment. And so you can see that the tumors with ENPP1 overexpression have um, much higher rate of tumorigenesis um, in addition to metastasis seen on the prior slide. So based on these studies, it appears that the effects of ENPP1 on promoting immunosuppression can occur at both the primary tumor site and in the lung metastatic niche. Now, we're currently investigating the mechanisms by which ENPP1 establishes and or maintains immune evasion. One possibility is that the absence of CGAMP in the extracellular space results in polarization of macrophages towards an M2 or an immunosuppressive phenotype. To this end, we queried our biobank of patient samples for which we've performed comprehensive sequencing and asked whether ENPP1 levels correlate with levels of immunosuppressive molecules. Indeed, we found that higher ENPP1 is significantly correlated with higher CSF1R on the left and MMP9 on the right. In other words, increased activity of ENPP1 is associated with immunosuppressive molecules secreted by tumor-associated macrophages. Now, we've also been studying the contributions of tumor cell intrinsic sting in mediating immune evasion. So here I've modified the working model on the left here slightly, and we hypothesize that similarly to high ENPP1, low sting results in a lack of a cell intrinsic type 1 interferon response and a similar ultimate immunosuppressive uh, phenotype in the, t in the tumor microenvironment. We first studied the role of sting knockout in the osteosarcoma cell line SJSA and found a pro-metastatic phenotype for sting knockout in the IV metastasis model on the left plot. And studies in our orthotopic model are ongoing, but there does appear to be a modest effect on primary tumor growth in that these sting knockout tumors grow more rapidly after orthotopic implantation. Now, wrapping up, um, lastly, we're working hard to expand these studies of sting and ENPP1 to immunocompetent model systems to further elucidate this immune evasion mechanism and the immune cell types involved. We engineered sting knockout in the syngenaic cell line K7M2 and studied effects on primary tumor growth with studies on metastasis in progress. We observed a significant difference in primary tumor growth with sting knockout tumors growing much more rapidly, shown here on the left plot, and all tumors reaching amputation endpoint before any tumors in the control group, shown here on the right side. So in conclusion, I've shown um, my data that tumor intrinsic sting inactivation via increased ENPP1 or sting knockout leads to increased tumorigenesis and metastasis in multiple animal models of osteosarcoma, including uh, syngenaic models. I'm working right now to generate and test additional syngenaic cell lines with sting and ENPP1 modifications, including those in uh, different genetic backgrounds that are uh, more poised to study the immune system. Um, and then I'll be performing uh, immunophenotyping in those models. Uh, importantly as well, I'm working now to initiate therapeutic studies with an ENPP1 inhibitor that we hope will translate um, to uh, humans. So uh, wrapping up, thanks so much, everyone. Uh, thank you to my mentors and colleagues in the Sweet Cordera Lab at UCSF. And thank you to Battle Osteosarcoma and my other funding sources for the really transformative support um, at this young investigator stage. Um, and lastly, thanks to all of you from afar for your attention, uh, your awesome presentations yesterday and your inspiring stories. Today I'll be presenting some preliminary research that I've been working on with Dr. Nancy Gordon at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center, focused on aerosolized gemcitabine to modulate the osteosarcoma tumor microenvironment and increase NK cell efficacy. So first I'll give you a, a little introduction to NK cells. Natural killer cells are part of the innate immune system and they are able to have a cytotoxic effect independent of HLA recognition. 
We can also take NK cells from healthy donors and expand them ex vivo for allogeneic transfer. These NK cells can be used against chemotherapy resistant tumor cells. However, there are some limitations to NK cell therapy, which include poor penetration in solid tumors, and there's a limited understanding of NK cell persistence and proliferation at tumor sites. There's also an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment that can limit e efficacy of NK cell therapy. Previous research has shown that adoptive transfer NK cell therapy can increase survival of mice with osteosarcoma lung metastases compared with mice that did not receive adoptive transfer NK cell therapy. Additionally, aerosolized gemcitabine has been previously shown to increase survival of mice with osteosarcoma lung metastases compared with mice that did not receive aerosolized gemcitabine therapy. Another study um, in the literature has shown that gemcitabine treatment of pancreatic adenocarcinoma patients led to a decrease in myeloid-derived suppressor cells over time, but there was no significant change in myeloid-derived suppressor cells in control patients. The same study found that T regulatory cells were increased over time in control pancreatic adenocarcinoma patients, but there was no significant increase in T regulatory cells in the patients that were treated with gemcitabine. And so both the myeloid derived suppressor cells and the T regulatory cells can have a negative impact on NK cell efficacy. So based on this previous research, we hypothesized that we could use an inhaled uh, low-dose gemcitabine to modulate the tumor microenvironment of osteosarcoma in the lungs to improve NK cell efficacy. First, we wanted to look at uh, MYC-AB expression in four different osteosarcoma cell lines, which are shown on the bottom of the graph um, on the right. And so uh, what we were able to find was that MYC-AB expression, which is a ligand for an NK cell activating receptor called NKG2D, was significantly increased after gemcitabine treatment. And this gemcitabine treatment um, is a low dose gemcitabine treatment of 0.5 micromoles for 24 hours in all but our CCHOSD cell line. So for the remainder of the experiments, we focused on OS17 as our um, cell line in both our in vitro and in vivo experiments. We also looked at um, cytokine, uh, uh, cytokines in, uh, soluble in the cell culture media using an isoplexus isolite analyzer in which we found that growth factors were significantly decreased in our gemcitabine-treated OS17 uh, culture, cell culture media compared with our OS17 cell culture media that did not receive any gemcitabine treatment. And uh, throughout this entire presentation, we're using our low-dose gemcitabine treatment, which is in vitro a 0.5 micromolar dose for 24 hours. Next, we wanted to look at um, additional NK cell uh, activating receptor ligands, which are um, listed at the bottom of this graph. And so these are ligands that um, are expressed on osteosarcoma cells. And after our low dose gemcitabine treatment, we found an increase in several of these ligands, um, five out of the six that we tested with our OS17 cells. Uh, next, we looked at cytotoxicity of our, N our human NK cells against these, this OS17 cell line, and we found um, in all but one of our effector-to-target ratios that gemcitabine treatment significantly increased uh, our NK cell cytotoxicity, um, even at our lower effector-to-target ratios. So our effector cells are our NK cells, and um, at our highest effector to target ratio, we have 10 NK cells to every one OS17 cell. So even when we uh, go down to our lowest effector to target ratio, we're still seeing about a 60% specific lysis of our OS17 cells after our gemcitabine treatment. Uh, finally, we wanted to um, look at uh, the effect of our low-dose gemcitabine um, in vivo. So we took NSG mice and injected them with an IV metastatic um, OS17 cell line labeled with uh, GFP and a luminescent uh, firefly luciferase. 
and we treated our animals. We started treatment two weeks after um, injection of our IV uh, OS 17 cells. And we, when we were able to see luminescent signal in all of the animals, we then divided the animals into four treatment groups. Our untreated control mice, mice that received aerosolized gemcitabine therapy, and again, this is a low, a, a subtherapeutic dose of aerosolized gemcitabine, NK cell therapy alone, and then combination NK cell therapy with aerosolized gemcitabine. And we, what we found was that there was uh, significantly less tumor burden in our combination treatment group compared with either treatment group alone and our um, control untreated mice. What you're looking at now are some representative images of one animal per group. And you can see that there is uh, a lot less of the um, tumors, which are the darker purple in the lungs of our uh, combination treatment group, compared with NK cell treated uh, mice alone or aerosolized gemcitabine mice alone. And the reason you're not seeing um, much of a difference between our aerosolized gemcitabine treated uh, lungs and our untreated lungs is because this is a subtherapeutic dose. So uh, we're only interested in what this dose of gemcitabine is doing to um, make the osteosarcoma cells more permissive to NK cell killing, not in actually decreasing um, the tumor with the gemcitabine. We were also interested in localization and persistence of our NK cells at the tumor sites. And so two of our treatments of NK cells were labeled with DIR fluorescent dye so that we could track them after injection into the mice. And so um, what you're looking at here is 48 hours after tail vein injection of DIR labeled NK cells. And we're seeing um, more DIR signal in our combination aerosolized gemcitabine NK cell treatment mice compared with our mice that received only DIR NK cells. However, IVA's imaging does not allow for precise localization of NK cells. So we took one mouse per group and analyzed it with a Zara 3D imaging system, which allows for more precise localization of, uh, or detection of the DIR signal. So um, what you're looking at here, the head of the mouse is up at the top of the screen and the tail of the mouse is down at the bottom. And it, we're able to see DIR signal, which is the um, yellow and the orange in the lungs and the liver of both our um, mice that received NK cells and the mice that received aerosolized gemcitabine plus NK cells. However, it does look like there is greater DIR signal in the lungs of the mice that received our combination treatment. So in summary, we found that a subtherapeutic dose of gemcitabine significantly increased ligands on OS cell lines involved in NK cell activation and binding. It decreased growth factors in our OS 17 cell line and increased susceptibility to NK selling in vitro. We also found that the subtherapeutic dose of aerosolized gemcitabine with NK cell treatment significantly decreased tumor burden in the lungs of mice as compared with all of our other treatment groups. Additionally, we found increased DIR signal in the lungs of mice treated with our combination aerosolized gemcitabine and NK cell therapy as compared with our NK cell treatment alone group. So we've concluded that combination therapy gemcitabine with NK cells can increase NK cell efficacy against osteosarcoma. We also th um, think that the therapeutic efficacy that we're seeing in our combination treatment could be correlated with the increased number of NK cells in the tumor in this treatment group as demonstrated by the increased DIR signal that we're seeing. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Gordon and the rest of the Gordon lab, um, including Emily, who's gonna talk next, as well as the Kleinerman lab, the Gopala Krishnan lab, and the collaborative imaging team at MD Anderson. Thank you. Awesome, and really sets the tone for my talk. Um, so I'm Emily, I'm also in Dr. Gordon's lab as a clinical fellow, and I'm so excited to tell you about CD70 and using CAR and K cells in osteosarcoma. 
Um, so like Ariana already pointed out, NK cells um, have a natural cytolytic activity against osteosarcoma, but the efficacy is really limited um, to be able to proliferate and penetrate the tumor capsule in solid tumors. So a lot of studies, including preliminary studies in our lab, have looked at other ways to kind of enhance that cytolytic effect and have preliminary sho preliminarily shown that um, aerosolized IL-2 helps bring those NK cells into the lung and have um, a better efficacy as shown in this graph from Dr. Gordon's lab previously before us. Um, there's a decrease in tumor number in the, uh, the group that was treated with aerosol IL-2 and NK cells compared to the controls. Um, and then there's also CAR T cells looking um, to target osteosarcoma, like targets with um, MAGE A3 and B7H3 as well. Um, so we kind of wanted to figure out a target for uh, NK cells to help increase their natural efficacy, and we, used, we chose CD70. Um, we know CD70 has expression on osteosarcoma, and this paper by Jens Paul et al. actually also showed that the expression is higher on the lung metastases, which is really key in our treatment uh, goals. Um, so here um, in panel A, they showed that this is using flow cytometry, looking at surface CD70 protein expression, um, and the black histogram is CD70 um, expression compared to the isotype histogram, which is grayed out. Um, and in A, it's primary site tumor, so you can see there's a variability in CD70 expression. In panel B, it's the lung metastases, and you can see that that is increased um, CD70 expression compared to the isotype control. And then panel C is looking at fold CD70 uh, protein expression um, in different cell type, or sorry, different tumor types, um, and osteosarcoma has higher CD70 expression. And then they looked at immunohistochemistry, the CD70 stains brown, and you can see it's really heterogeneous throughout the tumor, which is like the theme of osteosarcoma. Um, and, uh, and so that kind of gave us more insight into why it would be an important target. Um, another reason it's important to target CD70 is it's involved in cisplatin resistance. Um, in this study, looking at ovarian cancer patients, um, the ones that had higher CD70 expression were more likely to be resistant to cisplatin, which we all know is really important because it's one of the first line drugs that we give patients with osteosarcoma. Um, and then this is really important. So um, CD70 binds to its ligand CD27, which is on um, regulatory T cells, which I have in this picture here. Um, and that actually activates the regulatory T cells and then suppresses effector T cells at the tumor site, um, which decreases inflammatory cytokines, decreases um, the natural immune, or natural immune system to kill the tumor. Um, and so it's kind of a way for the tumor to evade the immune system. Um, so we, we identified CD70 as a good potential target. We wanted to know a little bit more about it. Um, it's part of the tumor necrosis receptor family, and it's part of the natural immune system. It's highly regulated, though, in the natural immune system, but tumors have found a way to um, overexpress it. Um, so like I told you before, it, it's involved in immune escape of, uh, by tumor cells um, in several different tumor types, but including osteosarcoma. But it also has a role in the invasive properties of certain tumors like cancer stem cell formation, hypoxia, which is a really immunosuppressive immune environment, and then the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which is when um, s cancer cells gain migratory properties to be able to go and, and create, uh, progress and create metastases. Um, and then there's also actually an anti-CD70 antibody already in clinical trials in patients with CD70 um, positive tumors, including patients with osteosarcoma, and so far has shown stable disease as the best overall response, but is very well tolerated, so it's very hopeful. So based on this preliminary information, we um, hypothesize that direct tumor antigen targeting using CAR NK cells directed against CD70 can enhance the natural NK cell cytolytic activity against osteosarcoma. So first we had to confirm in our own lab that CD70 is expressed in osteosarcoma, and you can see here this is uh, flow cytometry looking at mean fluorescence intensity um, on different cell lines. Um, this is compared to DHL6, which is in the middle, um, which is a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, which we know has CD70 expression. So we, um, on the far left is CCHOSD, has low CD70 expression, OS17 we call mid CD70 expression, and LM7 and SJSA have higher CD70 expression. Um, this was also confirmed using RNA-seq data, um, looking at CD70 in our patient-derived xenograft models from Dr. Gorlick's lab, um, and we again showed variable levels of CD70 expression, and again in 
uh, we did uh, immunohistochemistry, again, staining brown, the CD70 stains brown, and again showed the heterogeneity um, within the tumor. We wanted to make sure that we wouldn't have any off-tumor effects if we targeted CD70, so we looked at normal human osteoblasts to see if there was any CD70 um, expression there and confirmed that there was not. So normal human osteoblasts are in the black bars, and you can compare it to the isotype control. There's really no difference. And then our uh, cell lines, which we know have CD70 expression, are shown to compare. Um, we also found that CD70 is, um, I the gene is amplified using the C bioportal database, which was mentioned yesterday. Um, it's amplified in sarcomas, which includes osteosarcoma, um, which you can see as the red <laughs> that's labeled sarcomas. <laughs> um, so we wanted to first look at the natural cytolytic activity of against um, osteosarcoma using our OS17 cell lines, and Ariana already showed similar data with um, using a cytotoxicity assay. So at the higher effector to target ratio, so like the 10 to 1, the 5 to 1 NK cell to OS17 cell, we do have a good percent specific lysis, but we wanted to see if we could make it better with our CARs. So um, we, we looked at the control NK cells unmodified uh, compared to our CD70 CAR NK cell killing, and we actually found a significant increase in cytotoxicity and increase in percent specific lysis at the higher effector to target ratios against our OS17 cells. But to remind you, OS17 has mid CD70 expression, so we wanted to see if we, um, if the killing was altered by, um, or, or changed at all based on the level of CD70 expression. So we looked at our CCH OSD, which has low CD70 expression, and still confirmed that it, there's higher CD7, or sorry, higher cytotoxicity using our CD70 CAR and K cells. Um, so as Ariana already pointed out, we also had this really great tool, the isoplexus system, where we were able to co-culture our OS17 cells with NK cells and the CD70 CAR NK cells, um, and uh, got to see which uh, cytokines were released in that co-culture. Um, and I, we categorized them based on these um, different categories. And first, I looked at um, the growth factors. So OS17 alone had a really high amount of growth factors in them, like VEGF and PDGF, which we know are correlated with a poor prognosis. And when we co-cultured them with the NK cells and the CAR NK cells, we actually found a significant decrease, almost zero, uh, of the growth factors. But we also noticed that the chemoattractive and the regulatory cells were, or regulatory cytokines were increased when we exposed those cells um, to our CAR and our NK cells. So I looked into that a little bit further and actually found a significant increase in chemoattractive cytokines when the CAR and K cell was exposed to the OS17 cell as opposed to the CAR and K cell alone, um, which I looked a little bit more into the like MCP1, MYP1 beta, all those chemoattractive cytokines, and they actually are chemoattractants for NK cells and kind of enhance the, um, the killing that we see. So to summarize, um, CD70 is a great potential target for osteosarcoma treatment. It's not expressed on normal human osteoblasts. Um, the cytolytic effect of the CD70 CAR and K cell doesn't seem to be dependent on the level of CD70 expression, um, but there's a significant increase in cytolytic activity of our CD70 CAR and K cells compared to the control NK cells against our osteosarcoma cells. Um, and there's a decrease in growth factor and an increase in the chemoattractant um, and effector cytokines in osteosarcoma cells when they're exposed to both our control NK cells and our CD70 CAR NK cells. So to conclude, CD70 CAR NK cells have a potential to enhance the NK cell therapeutic effect and hopefully benefit patients with osteosarcoma. Um, our future work will include in vivo studies to look at the effect of CD70 CAR NK cells in osteosarcoma in our well-established mouse models um, and to try to understand more about the cytolytic effect that we see with our CD70 CARs. Um, so thank you so much to Dr. Gordon and Ariana too, um, and Dr. Kleinerman and her lab at Pradeep who is speaking too today. Um, our collaborators, Dr. Gorlick for the PDX models, um, Dr. Gopal Krishnan and Dr. Azbani who created the CARS. So thank you and thank you MIT. <laughs> All right, thank you all for the opportunity to share some of our work today. Um, I think some of the prior presenters have done a great job of uh, telling you about NK cells and why they're really interesting for osteosarcoma. And I think now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about the myeloid cells that are important in the tumor microenvironment of metastatic osteosarcoma. 
and how we might be able to overcome those. So traditionally, I think one of the paradigms for immunotherapy and osteosarcoma is it doesn't work because it's a cold tumor. You don't have lymphocytes which are present. So since you don't have lymphocytes present, you can't activate them with immune checkpoint inhibitors, and that's why checkpoint inhibitors and other immunotherapies don't work. What we showed when we looked at the tumor microenvironment of the pulmonary metastases is that's not exactly true. So if you look at the interior of your tumor, you do see that indeed these CD8 uh, T cells don't seem to make it into the interior of your tumor. But if you look at the periphery of your tumor, where the, uh, the tumor meets the normal lung parenchyma, which is at the very top of the screen, you do see the presence of these lymphocytes, which are colored in brown here. And if you put up the corresponding PDL1 slide, PDL1 being an immune checkpoint molecule, which is uh, important for stopping immune response, you see that these are almost mirror images of each other. It's as if the tumor recognizes there are lymphocytes which are present, and so they put up this focal PDL1 shield to stop the uh, immune attack. Now, this is all very well and good, makes perfect sense, except for the fact that we all know at this point that immune checkpoint inhibitors by themselves have not cured osteosarcoma. So for this reason, we did further experiments on our human uh, samples from patients with metastatic osteosarcoma to better understand how the tumor is evading uh, the immune response. To do these experiments, what we did was we did something called laser capture microdissection from these human tumors. So we mount these tumors on a slide and then actually physically dissect out these areas of interest. So we looked at that interface region that I was talking about, as well as the interior. We isolated the RNA from these two different sections and performed RNA-seq to look at the different genes that are upregulated at the interface versus the interior to give us a better idea of why these lymphocytes are getting stuck at the interface region of these metastases. And what we found was that, indeed, you can see, uh, well, first let me orient you a little bit. You have the sections that are from that interface region in the bottom in green. So each row is one sample from an interface sample. And then from the tumor interior, you have this uh, section in the middle, which is in blue. Each row is a sample which came from the interior. And so what you see is that on the left-hand side of this, you can see that indeed there are more of these T cells which are present at that interface region compared to the interior. However, when you look at this slide overall, the, the signal that screams most loudly is that you have these M2 macrophage uh, cells present both in the interior and at the interface. And these immune cells are not the kinds of immune cells that you want present. These are immunosuppressive, they prevent the T cells from being activated. And we think this is a very important part of why these lymphocytes are not able to penetrate further in is because of these M2 macrophages. And so you know, we really felt that you're going to have to address these myeloid cells. One other piece that we looked at, we looked at these dendritic cells, which are important because they are antigen presenting cells and work to activate your lymphocytes. And we found that these cells are present too. They're also there at the interface in the same spot that all of these T cells are present. So I want you to just file this away because this is going to be important for when we're talking about the RNA nanoparticle vaccine, which I'm very excited about. So uh, now shifting gears to a little bit of the work that we're doing at the University of Florida in collaboration with my mentor, Elias Sayor. Um, so he has developed this RNA na nanoparticle vaccine platform, which I think has a lot of promise for pulmonary metastatic osteosarcoma, and I'll tell you why. So the way that this works is that you take a tumor, in this case a pulmonary metastasis from osteosarcoma, you isolate the RNA, and you attach it to a custom lipid nanoparticle carrier, you amplify it and administer it intravenously to patients, with the idea that it can turn your cold tumors into a hot tumor and lead to systemic activation of your immune system in the periphery, in your bone marrow, liver, lymph nodes, spleens, all over. And what you effectively do is your, the RNA nanoparticle transfects your dendritic cells, causes them to 
present the tumor-associated antigens through their MHD complex, activate your T cells against the tumor which is present in your tumor, uh, and uh, ultimately lead to um, anti-tumor activity. What we see when we uh, look at this in a mouse model, K7M2, um, we see that um, you really wind up seeing a complete reprogramming of the microenvironment. So along the top, these TAMs, or tumor-associated macrophages, and MDSCs, or myeloid-derived suppressor cells, are completely depleted in these mice which receive the total tumor RNA nanoparticle. And equally important, you see significant increases in the activation of your dendritic cells, which are those antigen-presenting cells, and the T cells, which are responsible for killing the cancer. And you know, this is uh, critically important because, again, as we showed you in the human tumor samples, these dendritic cells and T cells are there. You just need to be able to manage the myeloid compartment. So the fact that this agent can work on both of these uh, two axes, I think, is uh, very promising. Um, additionally, uh, what we see in mice is that these mice that receive the tumor mRNA nanoparticle have significantly increased survival in the K7M2 model. And you can see that the mice w uh, that receive the RNA nanoparticle, when they reach the end of the experiment and you look at their lungs, the lungs are completely clear uh, in general of these metastases whereas the untreated mice, their lungs are riddled with osteosarcoma all over the place. So this really is, a, I think, a great visualization of the effect that the RNA na nanoparticle can have in, in the mice. I'm going to save some of our translational studies for an, another talk that I'm going to give uh, a little bit later, but uh, all of this to say that we also have some very exciting data about a comparative oncology canine model that we're doing with Rowan Milner and some of our collaborators at the veterinary school which I think is also very exciting. But part of the reason why I'm, I'm really, oops, uh, why I'm really excited about this in the near term is that this is an agent which actually has been approved by the FDA to be given in a, a phase one trial and has actually be, been used for our first patient for a, an adult with brain tumors. Meaning that th since this has already entered the clinic, I think there is a direct path forward to allow us to expand the IND and use this for patients with osteosarcoma, especially given the, uh, what I feel is compelling evidence uh, in this disease process. And what we would like to do is open a trial through the National Pediatric Cancer Foundation, a phase one, two study. Um, and as some of the other t uh, speakers have mentioned, I think the um, opportunity to treat patients with bilateral pulmonary metastatic osteosarcoma and potentially look at the treatment effect um, after uh, in the contralateral lung is, is a, a really exciting opportunity as well. Um, to briefly talk about our trial uh, design, uh, you know, our, our primary objective would be to demonstrate feasibility um, and then find the maximum tolerated dose. And then in the phase two, uh, look at the uh, event-free survival for patients who receive the RNA nanoparticle vaccine. And then we have a number of secondary and exploratory objectives, most of which relate to understanding how the na RNA nanoparticle affects the tumor microenvironment and uh, leads to um, activation of immune cells in the periphery. But for time, I won't go into these in great detail. So in conclusion, osteosarcoma pulmonary metastases represent an immune-excluded tumor microenvironment uh, compared to the immune desert of primary bone tumors. And thus, targeting these immunosuppressive myeloid cells may be necessary in order to unleash your lymphocytes to kill cancer. Tumor-derived RNA nanoparticle vaccines show evidence of reprogramming the tumor microenvironment in mouse models and early safety data in canines. And so we are proposing an expansion of an existing IND to test RNA nanoparticles in a phase one, two clinical trial for patients with metastatic osteosarcoma, hopefully in the near future. Um, so with that, again, thank you all for the opportunity to share some of our data. Thank you to all of uh, my, uh, my mentors back at Hopkins and the NCI and all the people that I'm very excited to work with now that I'm at the University of Florida.
everybody. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Kristen, and I am a pediatric oncologist that works in Alex Wong's lab, as in the guy sitting next to me. So, no pressure, Kristen. Um, and the work that uh, we're looking at is basically how can we modulate the tumor microenvironment um, in osteosarcoma as a potential for development of therapeutic options for patients with the disease. The only disclosure information I have is that I'm going to be discussing um, an investigational agent, TEW7197, also known as Vactrosartib, which is manufactured by Medpacto. So I think it's been pretty well established over the last two days that osteosarcoma has a complex genetic heterogeneity, which makes targeted molecular approaches to treating the drug rather difficult and frankly not really feasible. But what if we tried to target the neighborhood that the tumor cells live in, also known as the TME or the tumor microenvironment? Um, in, the, in that way, we could potentially make the TME less hospitable to these cells and allow the patient's own immune system to have some sort of a potential fighting chance. So literature suggests that TGF-beta is critical in the development of osteosarcoma. It's both a potent as well as an abundant immune suppressive um, molecule within the TME that's produced not only by osteosarcoma cells, but also produced by immune cells. Its expression has been shown to be increased in the serum of patients with osteosarcoma as, a compo as opposed to healthy um, individuals. And production of TGF-beta has been shown to correspond to a more aggressive phenotype of osteosarcoma, as well as the presence of lung mex. And these are just some articles that um, pretty much highlight these points. So our hypothesis is that targeting TGF-beta in the tumor microenvironment of osteosarcoma can potentially um, reduce and or ameliorate disease. Now, in retrospect, I should have put this slide after the next series of slides because this is actually what we're going to be doing moving forward, but um, I'll just ex explain it here. Um, in the next series of slides, what you'll see is that we've demonstrated that TEW can drastically reduce the growth rate of osteosarcoma um, in uh, murine uh, models um, by lymphoid and myeloid. Uh, enhancing lymphoid and myeloid activation within the TME. And so to expand on our early preclinical data, um, we're hoping to examine the immune-mediated anti-tumor effects of TGF-beta inhibitor in combination with immune checkpoint blockade to see if this has a synergistic effect using a humanized um, immune mouse model. And then the second aim we have is to hopefully translate this into a clinical trial in the near future. So none of the following would be possible without the following individuals who are also members of the Wong Lab and um, are very patient with me. So on the top right is the structure of TEW or Vactrosartib. This is an oral agent that um, is a TGF-beta receptor 1 inhibitor. It's currently been used in many adult trials for a variety of malignancies, but it's never been used in osteosarcoma before. And it's also never been used um, in a trial with children or adolescents and young adults. Um, the bottom right picture basically shows um, the pharmacokinetics um, against phosphorylated SMAD2 and 3 in healthy subjects who took the drug. Um, and then this demonstrates that four to eight hours after drug ingestion, um, TEW is, or I'm sorry, TGF beta signaling is completely suppressed. And then that signaling returns about 24 to 48 hours later. And then the last image shows that even at small um, concentrations, as little as 100 um, nanomolar, um, TEW can suppress TGF beta signaling in both murine and um, human osteosarcoma cell lines. So the next two slides are going to show similar things. Um, they're going to show the effects of TEW on this one on murine osteosarcoma cell growth in vitro. And the next is going to show the effects on human osteosarcoma cell growth in vitro at varying concentrations of TEW. 
So what you can see here is there's three murine osteosarcoma cell lines that were incubated with TEW at varying but increasing concentrations. Cell proliferation was measured by phase object confluence. So as cell proliferation increases, confluence will increase and vice versa. And what you can see is that with increasing concentrations of TEW, cell proliferation actually decreased. The same is true for human osteosarcoma cell lines with the exception of 143D, which is a CMIC amplified osteosarcoma cell line. Um, CMIC is a major proto-oncogene. If amplified in osteosarcoma, these patients tend to have a more aggressive phenotype as well as tumor mets. And basically, TEW had done nothing for this. And that um, kind of corresponds to why we want to pursue AIM-1, which I discussed before, about potential synergy with um, immune checkpoint blockade. This slide um, is basically going to show the direct um, tumor in, uh, osteosarcoma intrinsic effects of TEW um, on human osteosarcoma cells in NSG mice when the NSG mice were treated both early and late in their disease course. And what you can see in figure B and C is that tumor incidence as well as tumor volume was decreased in mice treated with TEW as opposed to those treated with vehicle and survival outcomes improved as well in mice treated with TEW. And this last slide um, is basically showing um, treatment of uh, valve seen mice, which are immune competent mice, um, with TEW later on in their disease course. So treatment was started at four weeks after tumor inoculation when pulmonary metastasis was evident by DLI. And what you can see in image, uh, sorry, in figure B, is that um, mice that were treated with TEW had decreased tumor burden or BLI signaling as opposed to mice that were treated with vehicle. And then in figure C, that's just a picture of the BLI imaging of the mice um, at both four weeks when treatment was started and then at 10 weeks. Um, and then lastly, um, figure D is a sort of a schematic of what we've been working on with respect to um, the looking, examining the synergistic effects of anti pdl one in combination with TEW when mice are treated three weeks after tumor inoculation, which shows um, not consistently, but does show some positive effect. And for that reason, that's why we would like to utilize this in a humanized immune mouse model. So what does all of this mean? Um, right now, we are working with Medpacto, both Sunjin and Tim, on the development of a clinical trial. And so when we presented this preclinical data to them, they went to the FDA, and the FDA awarded Medpacto orphan drug status for osteosarcoma, um, utilizing the treatment of Vactosartib in August of 2021. And so right now, I'm working on the development of a phase one, two trial with them. In the interim, we've had two patients in this country on compassionate use of Vactosartib, and I'm working on a third, um, getting a third patient compassionate use of the drug. One of these two patients is actually at our institution. And so I just wanted to share a little bit about how this individual is doing. He's a 13 year old male who has a history of osteosarcoma, initially in his right distal tibia. He underwent an amputation um, at the age of eight. He's had multiply relapsed disease since then, most recently in his right gluteus minimus um, muscle. He's had multiple therapies to date. In February of this year, he started Vactosartib after receiving radiation therapy to his right gluteus minimus mass. He's tolerating the drug very well. It has a very good side effect profile, and because the half-life is only 24 to 48 hours, most undesirable effects are out of the system if you stop taking the drug rather quickly. And um, most recently, his imaging in May showed evolving necrotic changes, resolution of the masses within the right gluteus minimus musculature, as well as decreased edema. Um, we plan for repeat imaging in August. He does still have some pet avidity of this mass, so he'll be undergoing a biopsy soon, and we're hoping to actually examine the tumor microenvironment of his, of his tumor. And so um, I think it's a lot of exciting information, and I want to thank um, Dr. Huang, because without this, I would never have these opportunities and patients would never have these opportunities, as well as Jay, Sunghee, and Suzanne, who work on this with me. 
um, my husband and my children who may not know what I'm talking about when I come home excited, but listen anyway. And um, my previous funding has been with Hyundai Hope on Wheels, and I'm in my third and final year of a K-12 award. But um, I want to lastly thank, because I won't be giving the same talk again in two hours, um, the Murdoch family in Charlotte, whose uh, memory I will honor every day. Thank you very much for the award and will help us with our future aims moving forward. And thank you, everybody. Um, hello and uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I am Pradeep and uh, I'm an RDC fellow. It's basically a postdoctoral fellow at um, MD Anderson. So uh, MD Anderson has this uh, uh, RDC postdoc fellowship. Every year they award like uh, one, two, at maximum two uh, applications per year. And last year they chose uh, this uh, study uh, based on the proposal that I submitted. So. Uh, so basically, I'm just a postdoc. Um, uh, uh, before starting, I I I, I wanted to thank uh, Christina uh, for 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 this opportunity so that I could uh, present some of my data, and of course uh, to the uh, Green's family for for supporting uh, me to be here. So uh, I'm I'm I am from the immuno uh, immunology background. So uh, for the cancer immunotherapy, uh, I think what we uh, we tend to forget is like is a pre-metastatic niche, meaning that uh, the tumor cells, before uh, landing up to the uh, metastatic uh, organ, which in, in this case is a lung, uh, it's already modulated, it's already changed, it's it changed from uh, to the immunosuppressive uh, milieu. So, uh, so we uh, we we think that unless we change this tumor microenvironment, it will be very difficult to to uh, to treat this um, disease. So in our in our uh, in this case we are targeting STAT three. So uh, just a disclosure: so the molecule that we are using uh, to target STAT three is licensed by uh, Molecular Biotech and uh, Dr. Prive and Dr. Zelensky. Uh, both are the co-authors of this study. So why STAT three? So STAT three is is a uh, is a therapeutic target in many cancers. Uh, uh, including uh, ad adult malignancies as well as, as, well as uh, pediatric. But so why it is STAT3 is because it regulates, uh, it's a transcription factor and it's highly upregulated in, in, in tumor cells. And it regulates uh, proliferation, cell viability, as well as cancer metastasis. But more than that, uh, STAT3, it, it regulates uh, immune suppressive microenvironment, meaning that it changes the tumor uh, microenvironment uh, it, 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 it regulates the dynamic cross talk between the tumor cells, uh, stromal cells, and the, as well as the immune cells. So uh, STAT3 is very important for macrophage uh, polarization, meaning uh, immune suppressive um, M2 macrophage or anti-tumor uh, M1 macrophage, as well as regulatory T cells, which is very important in, in, in for maintaining the immune suppressive microenvironment. So moreover, uh, it is also important for the activation of dendritic cells. And lastly, it is also, which I haven't mentioned, I forgot to mention here, is the, uh, the uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells. So these all four kind of uh, immune cells, they are very important to, to maintain the immune suppressive microenvironment of the, of the tumor, and especially in the long metastasis. So uh, WP1066 is uh, orally bioavailable uh, inhibitor, uh, and it's already in, a, in its clinical trials. So actually, MD Anderson just uh, completed uh, this uh, phase one clinical trial in, in adult malignancies. And uh, they just published uh, a, a publication. And whereas uh, 1066 is now um, uh, in phase one clinical trial in, in, in Embry uh, University uh, for uh, pediatric um, brain malign malignancies. Uh, so to start with, uh, so we briefly wanted to see uh, the effect of 1066 uh, on, on, on uh, osteosarcoma cells. This is just uh, in vitro experiment where uh, osteosarcoma cells were cultured in, in different concentration of uh, 1066. So as I can see, as you can see here, uh, 1066 was cytotoxic to uh, mouse uh, osteosarcoma cells. It, 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 it uh, inhibited the or decrease of cell viability as well as the cell proliferation. 
So similar observation was made in, in uh, human OS cells, OS 17 and uh, LM7, uh, at the ICCP value of two, around 2 or uh, 3 micromolar. So 1066 induced apoptosis in these in these cells, as you can see here by the when they we spin for uh, uh, NXM5 and then in a dose dependent manner and, and time dependent and the time course. So those those all the experiments were 2D experiments. So we we next tested uh, if uh, if this 1066 is also also effective to to reduce the tumor spheroids growth. So this is basically just tumor cells without any uh, tumor associated fibroblasts. So tumor spirits were uh, cultured and then treated every uh, 72 hours uh, with 1066. As you can see here, the 1066 does indeed inhibit the, the, the growth of tumor spirits uh, in, the, in, the, in the left. And in the right, it's the Rishajurin assay, where correlates with which correlates with the, uh, the number of viable cells in the tumor spirits. So 1066, it's, 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 it is effective uh, to prevent the, uh, to or inhibit the cell, uh, tumor cell growth, osteosarcoma tumor cells growth. So the next question was, uh, what is the effect of 1066 on the immune cell? So we briefly asked, like, uh, if 1066 does uh, increase the phagocytosis of, of osteosarcoma cells, because once the cells are, uh, are under this under stress or treated with, uh, with some agents, they are under stress and they upregulate the expression of uh, ITME signals. And one of them here is the uh, phosphatidylserine, and the other is calreticulin. So here, uh, K7M3 o o cells were uh, treated with uh, 1066, 24 hours, and labeled with CFSC, and cultured with the uh, macrophage. And macrophage is, is one of the important um, immune cells. Uh, so uh, after uh, two hours of uh, co-culture, and then we, when we analyzed, we observed that uh, if the K7M3 cells were, were uh, treated with 1066, they were more efficiently phagocytous than the untreated uh, cells. So this MH, uh, we, we, we did this assay with MHF, which is an alveolar macrophage cell line, and as well as the raw uh, cell line. So in both the case, those uh, 1066 treated cells were, uh, were phagocytos more than the untreated uh, cells. So uh, next we, we wanted to see what, was, what is the effect of 1066 in the MDSs. As Dr. Ligon said, uh, the ten MDSs is, uh, is one of the very important uh, immune suppressive cells. And we, uh, we, we performed this uh, myelin derived suppressor cells from the bone marrow, uh, cultured them with GMCSF and IL-6. And these MDSs were uh, cultured for 24 hours in different concentration of uh, 1066. So as you can see here, uh, we analyzed for monocytic MDSs as well as granulocytic MDSs. So surprisingly, uh, monocytic MDSs were sensitive to 1066. However, granulocytic uh, MDSs were not. This is the 24 hour time point. So, however, uh, when analyzed for the uh, cell proliferation based on the KICP7 expression, so we did see the decreased uh, level of KICP7, meaning less proliferation of uh, these MDSs, uh, in, uh, meaning the, the granulocytic MDSs as well. So taken together, uh, 1066 is cytotoxic to these MDSs uh, as well as inhibits the cell proliferation in vitro. So what is the functional aspect? So MDSs uh, does inhibit the T cell proliferation. So we briefly did in vitro assays where the MDSs uh, were either treated with 1066 or untreated and then cultured with uh, T cells. And after 72 hours, we did the follow analysis. So in the bead section in the, uh, in the left, if you can see here, um, without MDSs, the T cells does proliferate. This is CD4 T cells. However, when there is, uh, we co-culture those, those T cells with, um, with uh, DMSO treated MDSs, the proliferation of T cells is markedly reduced from almost 80% to 7%. However, when we treat these MDSs with, uh, with different concentration of, uh, of 1066, we the proliferation of T cells did recover. We also, and this is also we also observed the similar response for CD8 T cells, which is one of the important uh, effector uh, immune cells. Uh, Finally, we wanted to test uh, what is the uh, effect of 1066 uh, in, in in vivo. So in this case, we use syngenic uh, mouse model and, and uh, uh, experimental metastatic model where uh, Balsi animals were IV infused with uh, luciferase expressing K7M3 cells, 0.5 million cells. And after the, the, the tumor cells were uh, engrafted in the lungs after day seven, uh, then the animals were randomly uh, divided and then treated for uh, either with 1066 or the Becal control. 
so as you can see here in the survival graph, so animals those who were treated with 1066 at uh, 15 meters per kg uh, dose level, there was significant, uh, the, pro the survival was significantly increased as compared to the vehicle control uh, cohorts. Uh, to summarize so far, the 1066 does, uh, is cytotoxic to uh, osteosarcoma cells and uh, inhibits the growth of tumor spread, promotes the macrophage mediated phagocytosis is cytotoxic to MDSs and, and as well as uh, inhibit uh, uh, the so suppressive capacity of MDSs for T cell proliferation. And more importantly, the 1066 alone as a monotherapy has potential uh, uh, effect on, 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 on inhibiting the, the, the tumor progression. So to conclude, uh, what, uh, with, with what uh, this suggests that is 1066 is potentially an, an important uh, immune adjuvant uh, as an, uh, that can have an important uh, effect in combining 1066 with other uh, immunotherapy for the improved uh, therapeutic response. With this, um, I would just like to thank uh, my lab members and uh, thank you all. Just want to thank our panel for uh, for fantastic and, and just uh, thought provoking talk, but also being remarkably on time. I was looking at, I think they were very well prepared, and uh, just thank you so much for very exciting data. I'm um, open up the floor for questions, Mike. Uh, very nice talks, uh, everyone. Um, this question's for Ariana. Um, you know, in vitro, you were able to show that your inhaled gem upregulated NIC A and B. Uh, when you did your in vivo assays and you looked at the tumor cells, presumably, did you see upregulation of those molecules? Yeah, can you, you hear me? Okay, so <laughs> we're uh, still looking at that data right now. We're taking those tissues from our in vivo experiment and we're doing image mass cytometry on them to see um, exactly where um, all of those immune cells are in uh, the tumors and then also what the expression is of NIC A, B, and or enzyme B and all of the the different markers that we're looking at. If I could ask one more question, and it's to both Ariana and Emily. Uh, Emily, given that you're doing this inhaled gemcitabine, uh, or I'm sorry, Ariana is, and Emily, you're using the CD70 CAR and, and KCAR. Have you guys considered combining the two therapies to see whether you get sort of a, a, an augmented effect? Yes, um, thank you for that question. Can you hear me okay? I'm weird with microphone. Um, so I'm actually looking to see if I can use the low-dose gemcitabine to uh, modulate our CD70 expression, especially in like our low CD70 expressors, um, and then d I'll do a cytotoxic CD assay looking to see if that changes the killing that we see with our CD70 CAR um, and, and kind of go from there. But yes, I, th I think combinations are definitely the future, <laughs> so I and have I that lied. idea. Can, can I have one more question? Of course. Uh, one more, Mike, one more. And then I'm done. <laughs> Just in terms of NK cells, and uh, I think unlike T cells, lots of people have shown that NK cells don't persist very long in vivo. Um, what have your findings been in your, your studies? Yeah, so um, I only showed uh, 48 hours after tail vein injection, but we've done um, these studies with this DIR label of NK cells, and we've seen persistence of the DIR signal um, up to about two weeks, which was just the time point when our mice were no longer able to, to be kept in the experiment. We had to euthanize them. So I suspect that um, at least with this DIR label, we're seeing um, signal of, of NK cells for a very long time. Question back here. So this is a question for Pradeep. Um, you are going for this for STAT3 inhibition, which inhibits SMAD3 and that decrease the TJ theta cascade. Do you think it's a, what do you think the benefits are for going inhibition, inhibition of STAT3 compared to inhibiting TJ theta? Can you hear me? Oh, so, uh, so comparing STAT3 versus TJ beta, that is, that is a really good question. So uh, there are studies comparing uh, inhibiting TJ beta uh, Access. So what we wanted to address was if we can if we can inhibit STAT3 because it is a multi uh, 
pathway, it regulates multiple aspects. It's not just like when it, there is TGI beta, it, it, it's, it's more of immune suppressive. But uh, STAT3 is more like uh, from uh, angiogenesis, from uh, stromal uh, and, the tum and the tumor cell cross start. So if, we were, if you are able to uh, inhibit the STAT3 pathway, uh, then we may have multitude uh, array of effect. So that's where uh, we, we wanted to uh, try the, this uh, inhibiting this STAT3 pathway rather than the TGI beta, yeah. Um, my question is for uh, Dr. Young, actually. So really nice work. Uh, actually, the whole panel, they asked lots of questions here. But um, have you looked at all to see whether uh, there's a change in mineralization or matrix formation in your ENTP1 cells? Because there's a really well-known role for ENTP1 in bone development. And we've shown that matrix deposition is a major requirement for lung colony further formation. Great question. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's it, it's a really important consideration. Um, I have not directly looked at that, but I, I really should. Um, it's something I've been sort of delving into a little bit more deeply now that I, I repeated that uh, experiment recently and really saw that kind of incredibly well-conserved phenotype that I shared. So. Um, I can look at that probably histologically, and then also, um, you know, there's an ENTP1 mutant that is uh, recently published that um, only degrades uh, CGAMP, but um, not ATP, and so therefore sort of the kind of phenotypes in terms of bone mineralization would be conserved, and so I'm also going to be utilizing that to sort of um, really focus on what mechanism of ENTP1 is at play here. Dr. Mason has, oh, oh, Dr. Healy. Oh. Um, yes, for, for Dr. Young also, if this thing is working through CSF1, uh, um, why not just target that first? So similar, I suppose, to earlier question. And, you know, what other effects does it have? And what other things in CSF1 cascade is it not, it, it, it's going to elude and uh, block through this thing? Yeah, it's a very fair question. Um, you know, there is some promise of CSF1R inhibitors, um, as well as sting agonists, actually, um, in the clinic in other um, clinical contexts. So, you know, we've really been focused on whether we can sort of um, harness this kind of tumor cell intrinsic vulnerability. And so um, that's kind of why, historically, we've been focusing on ENPP1 itself, um, because uh, that targeting ENTP1 really should have effects that are kind of localized to um, the tumor um, because of the presence of uh, CGAMP and CGAS in the tumor with chromosomal instability. So uh, I think the um, kind of the opportunities are, are many in terms of kind of the translational relevance of this pathway. Um, and so appreciate the comments. I think these are all good avenues to try. I have a question for Emily. Uh, excellent talks uh, for everybody. Thank you very much. So um, one of the advantages of, of, of using NK cells is your capability, obviously, to allogeneic transfer. And um, the advantage of that is that you can select the best donor to do that. So I'm interested in, did you say see significant donor variability in, the, in your CAR um, NK, T cell, NK cells? And are you looking at potential signatures of those NK cells to be able to select the best donor? That's an incredible question and very well taken. Um, so we did see an in, a definitely a, a variability in donor. Um, it, all, all of our cytotoxicity assays were very donor dependent, even with the CD70 CAR, because they're derived from cord blood NK cells. So obviously there's variability there, which um, I think gives actually a lot of promise to the creation of CARs in the future, but also um, I have not personally looked into what causes that variability and what um, could maybe enhance the cytotoxicity of that, but I think that's an incredible uh, path to take, and um, I'm really hopeful that Dr. Rizvani's lab, who creates the CARS, will um, hopefully go into that, or, or our lab might look into it later too, but I think that's an, a really good point, and um, I'm not, I, I don't know what causes that variability, but I do think that it's important to look at, especially because I think we'll, we'll end up using them in the future in patients, so knowing which ones are the best um, will be really important. 
just one more question in this side. Up here. Thank you. Um, this is a question for Dr. Ligon. Um, you had showed uh, some of the survival curves um, when treated with your uh, RMP nanoparticle vaccine, but I thought there was something kind of interesting that you glossed over, which was the empty vector GFP nanoparticle also had a very significant extension of life. Um, <coughs> have you kind of teased out why that is? Is there some sort of just immunostimulating property of the nanoparticle itself, um, or have you not necessarily dug into that yet? That's a very astute observation that uh, I wasn't sure if anyone was going to cat because I was trying to you know, <laughs> squeeze everything into uh, 10 minutes. Um, but yes, you know, we, we have noticed that as well, um, that you know, there does seem to be kind of a nonspecific um, uh, benefit to giving kind of an empty vector uh, nanoparticle. Um, on the previous slide to that, actually, if you look at the data for the tumor-associated macrophages and myeloid-derived suppressor cells, you also wind up seeing depletion of the tumor-associated macrophages and myeloid-derived suppressor cells with the empty vector nanoparticle. But then when you look at the bottom of the slide, you don't see the activation of dendritic cells and T cells. So it seems like when you do the total tumor RNA, you get, um, you get both of those two axes depletion of the myeloid cells as well as activation of your dendritic cells and T cells, whereas the empty vector by itself seems to be capable of depleting your myeloid cells, but then you don't turn on your, your T cells. So I think that is likely uh, a, a big piece of why you see some extension in survival, even though you don't get clearance of the, the tumors uh, with the empty vector, but mechanistically we're, we're still working out all of the mechanisms behind it. Yeah, follow up that question to uh, John. Does it matter the source of your total tumor RNA, whether it's primary versus metastatic? Do you see differences in response in the primary tumor site versus metastatic? That is also a very good question that we're we're very interested in doing. I think in all of the <sighs> all of the experiments that I believe we've done, it's it's been um, you know, kind of based on, uh, you know, K7M2 um, in the, at least the ones that I was showing today, it was K7M2, you know, where we developed the RNA nanoparticle from the cell line. Um, so it wasn't like it was derived directly from the mouse. Um, in the canines, um, it's, uh, w which, um, you know, we are doing an amputation and then making the RNA nanoparticle from that primary amputation. But um, a question that we do have is whether or not, you know, if we were to biopsy one of their pulmonary metastases when they relapse, um, whether making an RNA nanoparticle from that metastatic tumor um, could be more effective. We just don't know the answer to the question. Well, yet. even simpler, if you use K7 as your source of your total RNA, do you see enough tumor antigen differences between K7 and source and K7? M3 or M2 to see escape barrier? That's a really good question as well. That I, I, uh, we haven't done the experiment yet, but that, that would be a great idea. Thank you. More questions, Brian. Uh, uh, one more question here for Dr. Shrita. Um, I'm wondering if you have done the experiments and, and know that the effect that you're observing in both the tumors and in the microenvironment is actually stat three dependent. And I ask that because ov obviously we've identified IL-6 as a major player. That's one of the primary activators of JAK2 stat three. And we went on a, on, a, on a long search for a good stat three inhibitor and thought we were seeing a great response and then ultimately found out that it wasn't actually STAT3. And we, a we actually published, a, it was a different inhibitor, but we published a paper that was essentially kind of a cautionary tale about STAT3 inhibitors. Um, the answer is that it, uh, uh, we, we haven't tried uh, directly targeting the STAT3, um, meaning like using maybe like siRNA or, 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 or techniques like that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, to the to your first question, uh, when I just did uh, we did uh, the by the whole long analysis, the that inhibitor had the effect 
especially on, on MDSs and uh, activated uh, classical dendritic cells. So those cohorts had highly, uh, high level of activated classical den uh, dendritic cells and a lo low level of MDSs. So, but if this is directly dependent on the statue by using those siRNA techniques like specific to the uh, uh, statue, uh, I haven't done that yet. But I agree to you that uh, statue is it's, it's a very difficult uh, target. And that is one of the uh, reason why, uh, because it's, it has multiple uh, proteins, like it's from stat one, stat two, stat six. So and there is high uh, uh, homolog between those those proteins, and then, but um, WP1066 is is it's high. It, it, they have there they have there are studies that it's a kind of like specific to stat three, uh, but I agree that uh, uh, there is no stat three like you know, highly specific stat three inhibitors. You know, I have a question from a parent, um, and as a parent. Hope is one of the things that we thrive on. Uh, this question is, if you could, discuss the potential for future osteo treatment standards to follow MAP with a safe immunotherapy for the non-metastatic patients that are high risk for recurrence. Um, treatments that don't require a lung tumor's profile, such as NK. The theory being that immunotherapy is used to prevent the fire before the microtumors are too large for immunotherapy to be effective. Can I can I chime in? Uh, <laughs> if you wouldn't mind speaking into, pull the microphone oh. closer, please. Um, uh, so, uh, osteosarcoma. When I started this this study, um, I, I was I was kind of like uh, puzzled, uh, not puzzled. I was kind of uh, sad to under, to see that uh, the models that we have, the animal models that we have, it's 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 not quite reflective of what's going on in a patient. So, so the model that we have, it's a, so com most commonly used, it's, it's, it is BALC, right? So which is highly TH2 skewed, meaning the, the, the mouse itself is very much uh, immune suppressive. Whereas uh, if you compare with other, other, um, uh, other tumors, so there are, there are an other animal models, which is B6, which is TH1, which are t uh, more immune cells, and we can study that. So, to, to, to properly address this um, immunotherapy aspect of osteosarcoma, we need to have these animal models because directly going to the, before going to the uh, clinical trials, we have to understand what, what is actually going on in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in this disease progression. And especially for the metastatic case, so uh, as I said before, we, we, we tend to forget it is the, there is pre-metastatic pre niche, pre-metastatic microenvironment. The microenvironment is already changed. So we, we have to understand how the tumor cells will progress from the primary to the, to the lung before it sits there and grows as a, in, as a different organ, right? So unless we have that appropriate model, it will be very difficult to dissect and then target that, that uh, 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 to find out the, the potential therapeutic uh, targets. So, but but the, uh, there was a there, there was a paper in Cancer Discovery uh, 2019 by a group in Garvin uh, Institute in Australia. They they fortunately came up with the B6 model, and I, I I hope we can use that animal model in a B6. So let's hope. Thank you. One last question uh, for the panel. Sorry, I'm asking a lot of questions. Um, this is for John. Um, for your RNA vaccine, um, you had mentioned, someone had pointed out about the vector control, altering the myeloid population. You mentioned uh, dendritic cells. Did you further characterize those dendritic cells? I thought I saw plasmacytoid DCs. Did you, are there other subsets that seem to be en enriched um, from your vaccine? That's a great question. Um, and I actually, in the, the talk that, um, that I, I, I give a, a little bit later, we'll get a little bit more into the you know, specific dendritic cells mm -hmm. um, uh, that I just didn't have time in, in this talk. Um, but yes, your, your point that there are, even within, uh, this gets to the how complicated the myeloid you know, subsets are. They're so plastic, they're so, um, they each you know, are just a little bit different from the next. So um, it, it's very important. Uh, 
We'll talk One about more it. thing. Uh, <laughs> Pradeep, um, in terms of stat three, so I studied stat three many, many ages ago, and to echo the point that uh, another person had made, I, I think it's a very difficult transcription factor to study in terms of its ability to form heterodimers with STAT1, STAT5. There are multiple cytokine signaling pathways that activate STAT3. Uh, in terms of inhibitors, you may want to reach out to Jenny Grandis at UCSF. She's done a lot of STAT3 in head and neck and probably has an inhibitor at this point, like 15, 20 years later from when Thank I worked you. with Thank her. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah. that's it. Um, and, and the last just comment is, I, I am a T cell person, and I'm hearing a lot of macrophage myeloid sort of biology here. Um, and it sounds like I need to learn more and about NK. that. And, and some NK. Uh, learn more about that field because it absolutely befuddles me. So we love to talk with you guys more. Thank you. The T cell people tend to be very T cell centric. I get it. <laughs> um, so can, can thank I just you so much. Mm -hmm. You guys have been fantastic. Uh, we are right on time. I think we're going to take a uh, 15 minute break, come back at 9.45, and I believe Dr. Hellman will be giving us. Correct. 9.40, please return to your seats promptly at 9.45. Dr. Hellman's going to give us an update on the Osteosarcoma Institute. Thank you so much. Thank you, panel. <laughs> <laughs>